Hello, this is Bernard Dan. I'm the editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. I'm delighted to introduce this podcast. In it, we'll be discussing the September 2015 issue of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, that is issue number 9 in the 57th volume of the journal. Now I'll be discussing with the North American editor, Peter Rosenbaum, who is Professor of Pediatrics at McMaster University in Canada. In this podcast, we will be focusing on an exchange initiated by Michel Schusterman about the use of the term cerebral palsy. So this exchange started as a letter of the editor by Michel Schusterman, who is the mother of a child with cerebral palsy, or, as she says, early developmental brain injury or interference, which first appeared in the February 2015 issue of the journal. There's been a reply, and now she replies to this reply, and the editors are discussing this. Hi, Peter. Bernard, good to have you here. Yes, I'm really happy to be here too. And we've got a nice issue here, the September issue. Lots in it. So we've got an opinion piece by uh, Dr. Ganesan about Maya Maya syndrome and what's really needed there in terms of new definition and clarifications. And we've got a number of papers about CP. We've got an Australian hip surveillance paper on recommendations. We've got papers on epilepsy associated with DCD, epilepsy post-stroke in Polish series, and uh, school outcomes in very preterm children, two interesting papers about feeding and swallowing, one attempt at giving stem cell therapy in four children with SSPE, which didn't show much benefit, but gives the opportunity for a nice discussion. And then we back to this correspondence on an opinion piece that Michelle Schusterman produced in which she proposed to move away from the term cerebral palsy to a wider concept, which would be early developmental brain injury. And then as we've been discussing this issue, it's a good time for refreshing our ideas on this. So what are your current ideas on the term cerebral palsy, Peter? Well, as you know, because you were part of it in, in 2004, we participated with about 35 colleagues in a discussion of the definition of cerebral palsy, came away after two days and several months of subsequent discussion with the idea that cerebral palsy probably still had a place in the lexicon. I think that the biggest addition and contribution of that meeting was the second sentence of the definition because we added as an explicit part of the definition the notion that although cerebral palsy is by definition a disorder in the development of motor control, the other potential manifestations of sensory and intellectual and and orthopedic difficulties are formally part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, what really struck me at that meeting was, first of all, the variety in experts that were attending. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that if we were going to think about concepts, it was for a very wide audience, including not only researchers and clinicians, therapists, but also the affected individuals, the families, the communities, and the insurance companies, the policy makers. It was really important at the time to come up with a definition, if possible, that would be accessible to all of them. But another aspect that impressed me even more, if you remember, Peter, at the end of the first day, after we had all the introductions and and a lot of freedom in the way things were presented, Murray Colstein, who had invited us, who had convened this meeting in Bethesda, told us that he thinks that it's really important to keep the term and to, to have this framework, to define, to redefine the framework, but while keeping the term, and I remember his argument was based on continuity with previous knowledge and the importance of funding. I remember he told us a story in in which the the previous week he wanted to go to a meeting on periventricular leukomalacia and he couldn't get the funding because the meeting didn't have 
the term cerebral palsy in. Have you encountered such arguments? I haven't had that kind of experience, but the experience I've seen, I've heard from parents is that because many people may talk about the same child using different terms, we often appear not to be having a conversation. Somebody talks about periventricular leukomalacia, which is, of course, a neuroanatomical abnormality. Somebody else talks about diplegia. Somebody else talks about non-progressive cerebral injury. Somebody else talks about cerebral palsy. They're all describing the same child, but it's the bit of the blind man and the elephant. Because with the different terms that are being used, it's not clear what level of discourse is going on. I don't think that's a problem particularly of terminology. I think it's a problem of thinking. One term that we did discuss then and decided not to keep is a plural form, cerebral palsies. And you know that some of our colleagues still like Mm -hmm. to emphasize the the heterogeneity by using the plural form. Do you sometimes use the plural form? Rarely. I'd rather talk about a group of conditions that fall under the rubric of what we are now calling cerebral palsy to remind people of the protean manifestations, the variability. But I think that the singular term is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I really like and I think is ever so important in Michel Schusterman's suggestion of a term which would be early developmental brain injury or interference is that it helps research also. Because in in a work that we we did together with other colleagues trying to review cerebral palsy, I had the task of discussing animal models to discover or to to realise even more that there are very few animal models for cerebral palsy, but many, many informative and very useful models for early developmental brain interference. Do you think that it's right to say that cerebral palsy falls into early developmental brain injury or interference? Yes, I think virtually by definition. But I remember even at the time of that meeting in 2004, there was a thought that we should have an umbrella term for all of the neuro disabilities in which we're interested. And Emphasizing the developmental aspect, which is so different absolutely. from later acquired absolutely. conditions. I think that's fundamental, and I want to come back to that. But one of the things that I know we have talked about there and that I have often talked about is the day after we abolish all of these terms, we will come into a room full of children with early developmental brain injury, and we will see some of them having motoric difficulties and some of them having behavioral difficulties and some of them clearly learning very slowly and some of them being visually impaired, and we'll start to (laughs) separate them. And we'll say, well, these kids have functional difficulties right. that seem to be similar. And so, in a way, it's, it's a bit of an artificial argument to say we should get rid of this term in favor of that term. I think conceptually, what you said a minute ago is most important, and that is that all of these conditions that we're interested in, whether it's autism or neurogenetic conditions or cerebral palsy spectrum, all have in common an impairment in brain development that has functional consequences, almost certainly has consequences for life, for a different life course, and has an impact on families. And if we can keep both of those ideas in mind at the same time, then we are not changing the terminology simply for the sake of having different terms. We are talking conceptually, and that's, I think, what's missing still. And how do you address the notion of stigma? when individuals or parents say to us, well, cerebral palsy has certain connotations, and if I am going to apply this to my child or uh, see this applied to myself, I'm going to experience this as social exclusion. I would want to understand why they were saying that, what they understood by the term. I do this when I meet with parents now, and when the conversation either starts with, my child has cerebral palsy, what is it? Or if I'm the person applying that label, I want to know what they understand by it. And I want to be able to take the time to interpret what I understand of cerebral palsy as a condition that is likely to have an impact on a child's development. But for me, the fundamental shift has to be away from thinking about what the child 
won't be able to do because of this condition to talk about how the child might be affected in their development by this condition and what we can try to help them learn to do. Mm -hmm. Or how the child might function mm -hmm. and how it mm -hmm. can help exactly. the child optimize this function, exactly. child or adult. Right? And the terminology, I think, will always be a problem if we rely solely on words because mm -hmm. all words have connotations and depending mm -hmm. on who you are, uh, what your experience is, that may be absolutely horrible or it may be very comforting because of your past experience. So for the definition that we first published in 2005 and then we had some refinement in the 2007 publication, we had a long annotation for all the 19 or so mm -hmm. uh, concepts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing that was important, but as you said, the the most important part in this definition is the fact that there are these two sentences. The first one is a modern rephrasing of, of the classic. older concepts. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Taking very much from Martin Bax's 1964 64, yeah. definition. But then there's the second sentence, which is about the accompanying disturbances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when we see this definition cited very often, the second sentence is not in. How do you think we could remediate this? Well, I think for, for those of us who are editors and reviewers, we should challenge people who leave out the second sentence. I think that your point in part is the fact that much of what is done about cerebral palsy these days is about motor disorders or the motor component of the cerebral palsy definition. And I guess that we need to remind people about the rest. We certainly need to remind clinicians about cerebral palsy being broader than just the motor difficulties. I think part of the difficulty, and you said it earlier, you know, I come back to the notion of development, that what we see in the emerging picture of cerebral palsy depends on the timing of when we look. Mm -hmm. uh, because the children who might be destined to have learning difficulties or sensory difficulties might not yet be showing those in ways that are as apparent as the motor impairments with poor head control or limitations in reaching milestones or in qualitative abnormalities or differences in motor function. But as the story unfolds, these become further manifestations of the condition. I have a bit of difficulty in, with the idea that some of these are secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're just later. Yes, well, it's actually very difficult to know, and, and some authors try even to define tertiary consequences. Uh, the difficulty in development is this interaction, yes. and I think that that's what makes the richness of development. But we hope that experience can be modulated, so we, we hope that there is some secondary uh, component to it, and this is why we think in terms of, of service, which is not yeah. just a compensation, but an enrichment of experience because of the primary problems. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I didn't express myself well. I would prefer to say that I think that impairments, if we just take the example of motor restriction, motor restriction is likely to limit a child's overall explorative capacity and probably their experience. And therefore, mm -hmm. there will be consequences of that, which I would call secondary. But I don't think that seizures, which appear at the age of five in the child with cerebral palsy, are secondary. I think they are other manifestations. And so there is, again, as, as you're pointing out, a very important nuance between secondary and remediable versus later evidence mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. impairment in whatever Michelle was calling it, uh, early developmental brain injury, mm -hmm. which can show different manifestations at different stages of the child's development. Yes, because the condition is so complex. Now, when you say remediable, to some extent, we, we should probably add. Well, I, I mean, I have been a huge fan of augmentative interventions mm -hmm. like power mobility and keep citing Charlene Butler's work from 30 years ago, which mm -hmm. showed the tremendously empowering, pun intended, empowering impact of powered mobility on children's development, on their social function, on their language function, on their exploration. Mm -hmm. Children who had profoundly important limitations, permanent limitations in motor skill, 
using only their own body, but whose horizons were enormously expanded with power mobility. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an example of an intervention which almost certainly changed both the child's capabilities and other people's view of the child in the way that you were talking about a minute ago, the transactional impact of a child who's getting into mischief, who couldn't before because they couldn't move. Uh, same thing with augmentative communication. When a child can tell us what's on their mind, we can have a conversation with them. Even if their output is somewhat limited, we recognize that they have ideas which we didn't recognize before we gave them an augmentative a way of a expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. What I find a bit frustrating is that now we seem to have the concepts, uh, we seem to have ideas for management, we're still not very far in terms of showing what works. That's absolutely true. A lot of what we do is still based on our ideas and concepts. And if we say that secondary, well, changes, you could even say that in motor function. Because of a primary, a problem in motor control, you can expect secondary problems mm -hmm. in motor control due to lack of experience. Mm -hmm. And we can have ideas about how to improve that. But for the moment, we think that those ideas are just good enough because they're good ideas. But there, there's still room for, for improvement. I think at least two reasons why we are so constrained are the lack of longitudinal studies, which are complicated to do and expensive but which are infinitely richer than cross-sectional studies. When we see a two-year-old, use my favorite example, a two-year-old who W sits, and therapists get very upset because that's bad for their hips. And I say, how do you know? And say, well, we've seen 10-year-olds who needed hip surgery who used to be able to W sit. And my, my rude answer is they probably also ate broccoli. But my not-so-rude answer is we really don't have good longitudinal studies of kids who W sat and kids who didn't W sit, to know whether there are differences in the outcome 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of studies are incredibly hard to do. But the other thing that we're missing, because of the tyranny of the randomized trial as the gold standard for evidence, is we're not looking carefully enough at individual multiple baseline repeated measures studies mm -hmm. of the sort that Charlene Butler did in, in the early 1980s, where she looked at these children with motor restriction repeatedly week after week and measured what their status was with respect to communication and play and so on, and then inter intervened and then went back and did the same kind of observations week after week to show that it wasn't just a before and after, but she was changing the basic patterns of the functions that she was interested in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, an underutilized approach to mm -hmm. research in uh, areas where the children are so complicated and so variable and so different from one another that the RCT is probably not going to give us the answers. Yeah, you made an excellent argument uh, for it in, in an editorial in the journal some time ago. And I think that precisely this sort of concept, like uh, Michel Schussman's suggestion of early developmental brain injury or interference, will help us consider the other areas which mm -hmm. might be relevant not fall into the destruction by reduction which we talked about earlier. Part of the difficulty, and I, I, I agree with and appreciate Michelle's ideas, I think part of the difficulty is that if conditions like cerebral palsy and autism are taught at all, they're taught in a very reductionistic way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so our responsibility as teachers, as educators, as writers, as editors, is to help people to expand the, the notions, whatever the terms. Because if we change the term, and I, I was thinking about this as I reread Michelle's uh, piece uh, this morning in preparation for this conversation, we can change the words, but unless we help people get under the surface of the words, we'll simply have different terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, the DSM-5 has got away from Asperger's syndrome and all these other things, but what is autism? Well, I mean, there are different groups of kids with autism and people with autism, some of whom function well and some of whom function less well. And we still have to have a depth of understanding, which is more than the three words of the, time, of the, of the condition. So do you think we've embarked in a period in which both terms will coexist? A, more, a broader term like early developmental brain injury stroke interference and within this cerebral palsy, 
and gradually the, the borders will erase and and CP will just dissolve into this sounder and wider concept. I'm, I don't know. You talked about Murray Goldstein's point about mm -hmm. you know the terms. We have very famous people, as Nigel Paneth pointed out to me, we were at recently, two of the very famous physicians of the late 19th, early 20th century were Sigmund Freud and William Osler, both of whom wrote treatises on cerebral palsy. They didn't write about early developmental brain injury, but they were really thinking much more broadly, quite frankly, than many people are today. Uh, Freud was speculating on the genesis of cerebral mm -hmm. palsy and the potential for cerebral palsy to be caused by conditions that predated the delivery. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, you know, 85 years before we had ultrasound. So he was thinking clearly. He didn't have the evidence to support it. I don't know whether we should get rid of the term because there's, a, as, as you pointed out, a very rich body of uh, literature on cerebral palsy. What I hope is that if people expand their awareness of the early developmental brain injury and its impact, that they will read that literature critically, that literature on cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. more critically because they have a broader understanding of what underlies it. Okay, well, so this is certainly what we're going to do for the time being in the journal. We're going to keep the term cerebral palsy, we're going to keep our minds open and see how this can bring new fruits. I actually have one other thought. The journal started off being called Cerebral Palsy Bulletin, Bulletin. Mm -hmm. and then became Developmental Medicine. Mm -hmm. But there's still, there's still a long way to go to get people to understand the concepts of all of these conditions. Mm -hmm. back, getting back to your points about not only the early onset, but the impact and the potential to intervene in ways that will potentially prevent some of the consequences of the impairments from interfering with function. And we certainly welcome the debate. We certainly welcome such input. Yes, from a very thoughtful yeah. parent. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter, thank you for having me here right. at McMaster. Thank you very much for the opportunity to chat about these ideas.